Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Joanna Cohen. I'm the director of the Institute for Global Tobacco Control, and I'm really pleased and privileged to be able to introduce our speaker today for our Innovations in Tobacco Control series, Dr. Tim Dewhurst. So Tim is an associate professor at Guelph University, which is very close to Toronto. He's in the Department of Marketing and Consumer Studies, and he really is sort of a market, tobacco marketing guru um, worldwide, okay? He does, he works on other areas as well, but he was trained by uh, Dr. Rick Paulet from the University of British Columbia, also top, um, uh, top expert in this area. And because of all of his expertise and training, um, Dr. Dewhurst is uh, involved in giving expert testimony at, in a number of key litigation uh, cases, including the recent, the case that was uh, where we recently heard the outcome in Uruguay. Uh, he also has given testimony in Canada and the United States. Um, he was at the University of um, uh, California at San Francisco uh, ma a number of years ago as a Fulbright scholar with Dr. in Dr. Stan Glantz's lab, uh, where he worked on um, tobacco industry documents related to his area of expertise. He has also done, um, he's been a visiting scholar in, Korea, in South Korea and in Australia, so he's um, been able to get, um, b been exposed to a lot of different ideas, learned and has um, really learned a lot that's contributed to his expertise. Um, he looks at industry documents and, um, really focuses on the marketing and marketing research agendas of tobacco companies and how they use marketing and branding to sell their products. Uh, he's been cons a consultant with the World Health Organization regarding the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, um, Article 13, which is the tobacco advertising promotion and sponsorship area of the framework. Uh, he's been a contributing author to a couple of mo key monographs from the National Cancer Institute, one on low-tar cigarettes, um, it's a number of years old, uh, still, still, um, and then also the key monograph on the role of tobacco, uh, of the media in promoting and reducing uh, tobacco use. So um, we are so lucky to have such a world-renowned expert here, and he's gonna be talking to us about the principles of tobacco branding, so welcome, Tim. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Joanna, uh, for the introduction, and I would actually uh, like to begin this presentation by thanking Dr. Joanna Cohen uh, just for her support for a lot of the work that I'm going to be talking about over roughly the next hour, uh, and also acknowledge uh, an award uh, from the Institute for Global Tobacco Control at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, uh, again related to a lot of the work that I'm going to be uh, talking about during today's presentation. Uh, so as mentioned, I'm going to be providing a little bit different lens coming from the Department of Marketing and Consumer Studies, College of Business and Economics at the University of Guelph, which was mentioned uh, that's just about an hour drive west of Toronto in Canada. And I'm going to be speaking to you about principles of tobacco branding. And I think a good starting point of any presentation is to define some key terms. So what do we mean by branding? Um, and so the common definition, according to the American Marketing Association, is that it's the use of a name, term, or symbol to identify a product and give it differentiated meaning. And then a related term is brand equity. And this refers to the financial value of a given brand uh, and relating to their branding strategy, where you have a number of metrics that you're interested in, where you're trying to assess to what extent they are assets or liabilities related to metrics such as brand name associations, uh, common brand image, perceived quality, and so on. Now the definitions that are provided can be found in the work of David Acker. He's Professor Emeritus from the Haas School of Business at Berkeley, and he's certainly a, a key authority in the brand strategy and brand management literature. So for those of you that are interested in knowing more about the basic principles 
uh, of branding and brand strategy. Uh, I'd alert you to books such as Building Strong Brands, Managing Brand Equity, and also Brand Leadership. And then another go-to resource commonly is Kevin Lane Keller's book, Strategic Brand Management. And he's a marketing professor from the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth. Uh, this book that you see here is commonly used for a number of fourth year undergraduate electives at business schools on brand management and strategy. Uh, he has consulted for a number of notable uh, brands and companies such as Starbucks, Nike, and so on. Uh, but I should also preface that it's my understanding that he's also testified for the tobacco industry in litigation. Um, but again, a good resource in terms of basic principles of branding. So commonly when we're looking at the first part of the definition of the use of a name to identify a product, uh, these are common general principles of brand, good brand names and often you want to be, uh, there are exceptions to the rule of course, but commonly you want to be short, simple, easy to pronounce, memorable. Uh, adaptable for multinational use uh, so that it'll be easy to pronounce with those who are speaking in a, in a different language. Uh, you also want it to be legally available for use in terms of uh, uh, whether uh, there's trademark infringement uh, issues and so on. And then ideally too that uh, it's adaptable when you offer uh, additional products uh, associated with the brand name that uh, it, it still makes a lot of sense. And so applying this practically to some cigarette brand names, I have here, for example, Kent Cigarettes. Uh, this is a reflection then that, that uh, when the brand was launched in 1952, uh, the producer of this brand was Lorillard, and their president and CEO was Herbert A. Kent. And so it was speaking a lot to the confidence of their newly introduced brand that it would be named after uh, the president of the company. Uh, Advanced Cigarettes, this is a, a product that was launched by Brandon Williamson. It was test marketed in Phoenix in 2004, but the brand name really speaks to progress, seemingly an improvement being made. There's technological associations, and this is a brand that was making ad claims of still tastes great, but less toxins, and was targeted very much towards a health conscious uh, consumer. And so again, trying to associate the product with seemingly making advances of harm reduction. And then Cool is an example of a brand name with multiple meanings and interpretations. One interpretation would be the cool, sens uh, refreshing sensation that one would have in their throat uh, from a mentholated brand such as Cool. But another meaning is that someone who is cool is very collected and composed in have their emotions in check. And then certainly if you consider adolescence and the, and the importance of a peer group, the cool member is usually someone that is aspirational, that we look up to, that seems sort of very with the times and more in a leadership role. Uh, one more example is Virginia Slims, uh, a brand launched by Philip Morris in 1968. Uh, the Slims part of the brand name refers to a reduced circumference cigarette. Uh, the advertisement you see here refers to supposedly uh, fat, stubby, sort of wide cigarettes were for men, whereas the slim reduced circumference cigarette was supposedly uh, to fit the hands and needs and desires of women. Uh, and then also slim refers to someone that has a slim physique. And this does reflect market research that has shown that uh, for some, smoking is a way of uh, suppressing their appetite and controlling body weight. There's also been concern that those that are making cessation efforts, that those that do quit often do gain weight. And it has been shown that women are usually less successful at cessation attempts than men. And this might be in part a reflection of the concern of often gaining 10, 12 pounds as a result of uh, quitting smoking. Uh, in terms of Virginia, uh, this can refer to a woman's name and was a brand targeted towards women, uh, but also refers to the state of Virginia, which is known for tobacco farming, and, uh, and certainly Philip Morris has important head offices uh, that are situated within the state. 
so generally speaking, though, when giving an overview of a lot of cigarette brand names, there are many examples, and I'll discuss a lot of these in turn, where brands have been named after people, places, animals, as well as numbers, among some other themes. So let's start with an example of some names, where these are examples of brands where often they're named after the founders of companies and really speaks to the heritage and tradition of the particular brands or given tobacco companies. And so here are some British tobacconist examples where Lambert and Butler uh, re reflects that Charles Lambert and Charles Butler uh, opened a tobacco shop in London, England, and it was in 1834. And then you see Benson and Hedges. Uh, this is a reflection that Richard uh, Benson and William Hedges opened a tobacco shop uh, on Old Bond Street in London, England, and this was in 1873. So again, really speaking, to, there's a lot of tradition, a lot of heritage and history uh, to these cigarette brands and, and the companies. Philip Morris is often a brand that's linked with Marlboro and thought of as very much an American brand, but Philip Morris actually again reflects a British tobacconist uh, that uh, opened a tobacco shop in England, and that was in 1847. And so Philip Morris has a company named after him, uh, Philip Morris USA, Philip Morris International, uh, but there is also a particular cigarette brand that is also named uh, Philip Morris. So I've given a lot of examples where the brand names reflect the founders and origins of the company, uh, but there are also many examples of brand names that point to licensing uh, or brand sharing agreements. And so uh, the example that I have here is Harley-Davidson cigarettes. And again, this is a reflection of being named after founders and after people, in that Harley-Davidson Motorcycles dates back to 1903. Uh, it was founded by Bill Harley and the Davidson brothers. Uh, but there was obviously a lot of equity, uh, strong brand imagery associated with Harley-Davidson. It's a very iconic brand. And so with a licensing agreement, where basically uh, Laurelard Tobacco Company was paying a fee to Harley-Davidson for use of the name and associated branding uh, to launch a Harley-Davidson brand of cigarettes uh, in the 1980s. And so this is a strategic way of having a very instant brand identity uh, when launching a new brand of cigarettes as a way of competing with the likes of Marlboro and so on, of where instantly people really had a common understanding of what the associations of the brand are supposed to be. Uh, there are also examples of human brands where often licensing agreements reflect uh, the names of celebrities and very well-known people and personas. Uh, I mean, the Trump uh, Towers and different properties around the world are a classic example of licensing in effect. Um, but applied to tobacco, there are many examples where there's been similar licensing deals. Uh, one such example was Laurence Olivier. Uh, who was a very uh, famous British actor uh, known for stage theater and sort of the classic uh, uh, theater, but also featured in TV and, and movies, uh, was knighted in 1947. Uh, but this is an ad that you see here from 1956 where uh, the brand is named after him. You can see that there's a photograph of him. Uh, his autograph is there. There's literature that refers to the signature effect where it gives it authenticity and credibility uh, that there is a signature there. But he very much endorsed the brand uh, and very much was pushing the brand. Uh, he was known to be you know, on set encouraging his peers and those on the set to, to, to consume the brand because he actually received a certain percentage um, of, of the sales uh, for each brand of the cigarette. Okay, those are some examples of cigarette brand, brands named after people. Uh, I'd now like to turn our attention to some examples of places. And so uh, Winston-Salem uh, in North Carolina is the headquarters of R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company. And so reflecting this, two of the 
brands that they produce are Winston and Salem. So again, speaking to the heritage and origins of the company, but using place. And then in this particular example, this is a package uh, from the Johns Hopkins Packaging Surveillance Project. And uh, the package that you see here was from Vietnam in 2013. But you can see that they're also speaking to basically US as a place and, and, and New, very much New York with the familiar skyline of the Statue of Liberty, um, the, the Chrysler Building, and so on. And so really talking about, as you can see on the package here, the New York Limited Edition. Uh, this is available online from the Surveillance Project. Uh, this circulated or was uh, acquired in Pakistan during 2013. But again, Salem reflecting a place where the producer is situated. And then this is an example of a brand that was acquired in Vietnam in 2013, uh, Texas Five. And again, referring to a place Texas is a state that's known for being very bold. <laughs> Everything is supposedly bigger in Texas. And so actually you have typography that's sort of the block letters that sort of reinforces that notion of being bold and proud. Uh, it's also known as a place where there's a strong loyalty to the state and a sense of independence. And Texas Five is a brand name that refers to that you know, proposal for five states within Texas if, if it was to be independent. And then also Texas is very much a part of the American West and so this is a very similar image to what the, you would imagine with the Marlboro Man and so that whole notion of ruggedness, masculinity, independence with the pictorial depiction that you see to complement the brand name. And then I think this is a good segue to talk about Marlboro Country. And this is a particularly interest, interesting example of reference to brand in place because many will think of Marlboro Country as the American West. So states such as Utah, Arizona, Texas, and so on will come to mind. But this sets up the dynamics of a real versus imagined place because this is all playing upon the mythology and Marlboro Country in itself is of course not a real place but, uh, but it's still very powerful, strong imagery that's conveyed. And so again, as much as it's an imagined uh, place, you can see that there are very specific real uh, places that are identified within their marketing communications. Okay, and now I'd like to talk about a third theme of brand names, and there's many examples where animals are referred to. And so one such prominent example is camel cigarettes. And so as much as it is a blend of American and Turkish tobaccos, uh, you can see that the pictorial representation there really infers that Egypt with the, the pyramids and so on. Uh, now this reflects that uh, it was Turkish paper initially, uh, used for camel cigarettes, but it was uh, meant to resemble Egyptian cigarettes that were very stylish at the time. So uh, they're make, very much making reference to Egypt uh, in terms of uh, using a camel animal as a representation. And then one more example, again, this was uh, drawn from the surveillance project available online, uh, but with uh, panda cigarettes, uh, a cigarette brand with presence in China, and a panda is a very you know, nationalistic, patriotic symbol uh, within China. And you can see, correspondingly, uh, a brand of cigarettes for the animal. And then there are a number of examples of brand names where it reflects numbers. And so in this particular example with 2000, it could reflect you know, a new millennium and sort of notions of celebration or technology and sort of looking, being futuristic or being nostalgic of often at the end of a century, it is a time where you see a lot of marketing communications that does refer to the past in a very nostalgic way. Uh, numbers can be used to celebrate important anniversaries uh, or you know, the independence of particular countries and so on. And then there are certainly numbers that are considered lucky, uh, and that can be really culturally based of what numbers are considered lucky or unlucky. Uh, and then there are a number of cases where brands reflect the number one, uh, partly 
in part to reflect a leadership position, that they're the number one selling or most popular brand. Uh, but also, numbers can be used, and I'll discuss this in further detail shortly, but to infer the supposed tardy yield delivery of particular brands. And so Uno, uh, with the zero actually giving particular emphasis, seems to really reflect a very supposed low yield of tar being delivered, and this is a brand uh, that is meant to appeal to a health-conscious consumer with supposedly reduced yields. So that gives an overview of some examples of brand names for cigarettes. And if you recall the definition of looking at the name and use of a logo or symbol, I'd now like to turn our attention a little bit to the second part of the definition and talking about the use of symbols and logos. And this is often considered the single visual element to define a brand or firm. And similar to brand names, you often want something that's memorable and so something distinctive about it perhaps relating to benefits or perceived benefits of the product uh, and just something that's uh, quite yeah, bold to be noticed. And so a classic example with respect to cigarettes is with Lucky Strike. Uh, this reflects that in 1941, they did modifications uh, to the modern cigarette package and it was done by Raymond Lowy, uh, who is considered the pioneer of industrial design, uh, well known for being behind the designs of Shell, Exxon, uh, the postal sort of stamp of the American, um, of the US Postal Service. Uh, but he was also commissioned, uh, and at the time it was in 1941, uh, paid $50,000, sizable sum at the time, uh, to make the modifications. And Lucky Strike, up until that time, it had a green background, but they had advertising campaigns that uh, said gr green is being used going off to war. And that was used as an excuse to replace the background color with white. He also sharpened the typography of Lucky Strike. And then also the Lucky Strike target motif that's so well known was used both on the front and back side of the package that was matching. And uh, just speaking to sort of how classic of a design the modification was, it's basically been untouched and unmodified for now roughly 75 years. Uh, one other example is the One uh, cigarette brand. And this is produced by KTNG, uh, South Korea's leading tobacco company. And uh, here they use the circle as a visual representation. And so that can certainly convey wholeness, perfection. Uh, it can be seen as protecting what's bound within the circle. Uh, and then also within Buddhism, the circle is a very powerful image where often a circle would be drawn on a wall and you'd meditate upon it and sort of a feeling of oneness. And so these are all sort of powerful notions associated with such a visual representation. And Again, you can see with their marketing communications giving great emphasis to that circle and a different color being used for the different variants of that brand family. There are also many cases where symbols and logos become so powerful that basically they're recognized almost universally even without the use of the brand name or any other sort of anchoring information to tell you what the product is about. And so often if you've had more than 100 years of history for a company and very significant uh, publicity and exposure with your brands in terms of marketing communications and so on, you can achieve that status, which we see with Shell, Nike, Mercedes, where I could show you the logo and virtually everyone in the room would know, be able to identify the brand name in question. And just speaking to this visually with Nike, you can see print advertising that they had where they make use of the Nike swoosh, but they don't anywhere mention Nike. They, this is a dated ad given that uh, there's just a toll-free number listed uh, rather than a website uh, to go for further information. But again, there's no concern that people will you know, have any confusion about the brand name in question. And then for those of you, I think it's a very international audience here today, but those of you that have been traveling, even though you might not speak the language where you are, again, the power of logos where there's often not a trouble understanding. 
Uh, here you have different soft drinks or pop, uh, where uh, this is in Thailand, and I've been fortunate enough to travel in Thailand where I don't speak Thai, I can't comprehend Thai, but I would have no trouble uh, if I saw this at a bar of uh, knowing which brand in question you know, was on offer. And so applying this to cigarettes, I think the Marlboro rooftop has very much achieved such status of where it's an interesting scenario in Canada because Imperial Tobacco, which the parent company is British American Tobacco, based on past history with mergers and acquisitions and so on, they have the legal rights to the Marlboro name, not their uh, key competitor, Philip Morris International or Rothmans, Benson & Hedges in the Canadian market. Uh, so Imperial Tobacco, with the power of the Marlboro brand name, continue to offer in very limited supply a Marlboro brand, as you see on the bottom right of the screen, and it has a yellow package. Uh, but Philip Morris International certainly wants to build upon the brand equity of the famous, you know, world-leading uh, Marlboro brand. So they've launched a brand essentially with no name, sometimes referred to as a rooftop brand if you were... Uh, to ask for it at the point of sale. But you can see that they make use of the familiar rooftop and logo and designs without having to use the Marlboro name. So as much as I presented branding defined as quite simplistic as the American Marketing Association does, uh, it's widely acknowledged that branding strategy involves more than just a name and logo or design. Uh, it also refers to the use of taglines or slogans. So you can think of Virginia Slims and you've come a long way, baby, is very much you know, shorthand for the brand message and you know, in, inferring uh, women's you know, liberation and so on. Uh, in terms of typography, uh, you can use sort of block uh, capitalized letters to be more bold and powerful in what you're conveying. Uh, con in contrast, you can use all lowercase letters to be seen as more approachable as a brand and more sociable. And then certainly there are different fonts uh, and types of type typography that can convey more prestige if you're thinking of calligraphy uh, versus those that are more casual and fun or youthful, masculine versus feminine and so on. And then in terms of characters, uh, there was Joe Camel. Uh, that was under incredible scrutiny during the 1990s from R.J. Reynolds, uh, the Marlboro Man, as a representative of the Marlboro brand. And then, of course, there's the use of primary and secondary colors, which I will speak to in a little bit more detail. At this point in the presentation, I'd like to turn my attention to two case illustrations, which uh, speaks to two papers, manuscripts that have been accepted for publication in the journal Tobacco Control. And they're now available online first, and they are available uh, open access. So if you do have a further interest in the subject matter that I'm speaking about, uh, I invite you to go to Tobacco Control Journal's website, and you can easily download and read or print uh, uh, and save those articles. Uh, but the articles I'd like to talk about in more detail are first talking about the role of the Marlboro brand family and brand architecture. And often, I mean, historically, when we're thinking of the brand family of Marlboro, you would think of the original parent red colored package brand. And then in 1971, they introduced what was called Marlboro Light at the time. Uh, according to jurisdiction, it's either Marlboro Light or Marlboro Gold today. Uh, they've also introduced other members of the brand family, such as the blue colored package that's often Marlboro Medium or Mild. Uh, they also have a silver color package that was once extra light in many markets, now is called silver. But the whole role, or the primary role, as acknowledged on the Philip Morris International's website of these brand families, is to create a hierarchy of supposed tar deliveries of these brands. So you typically have the parent brand, that's the anchoring brand with the highest tar yield delivery. And then you have a hierarchy or a sequence of lower offerings of supposed tar yield. And this is very erroneous just because it's not a accounting for uh, smokers' typical compensation behavior, that if they do make that transition to a lower yield brand, 
uh, to maintain their normal nicotine delivery. Uh, they'll often actually sm inhale more deeply, smoke more of the cigarette, smoke more cigarettes per day, but often this is subconsciously, uh, but there isn't that harm reduction effect uh, that's often been communicated in the marketing communications. Um, but Philip Morris has acknowledged that they like to use the terms light and mild where possible, uh, but increasingly in jurisdictions where they're not able to do so, uh, they've used a number of codes and strategies, again, to communicate the sequence or hierarchy of supposed tar yields. And so here's an example of the brand family at one time that was available in Uruguay, where you see the marble red represents the full flavor parent brand. Again, blue, medium or mild. Gold uh, as light, and then silver, the ultra light. Uh, supposedly. So again, the color scheme really communicates to consumers this hierarchy of tar yields. And then we also see some brands use a strategy of using just one color for the brand family. That's historically been the case for Players, a leading brand in Canada. Uh, in Uruguay with Premier, the brand, you can see that they've used blue again, central to the brand, but use different hues or tones to communicate supposed uh, tar delivery and yield, and so the darker, richer blue you know, has a higher tar yield, uh, the one that's a, a lighter, paler blue, a lower tar yield, supposedly. And then there's the common use of number codes, and so here's a, the Vantage brand that's uh, produced by JTI, Japan Tobacco. Uh, the image of packages that you see on the lower part of the screen uh, it was during the 1990s in Canada, and you can see the sequence of numbers of where they have 9, 5, 4, 3, 1 of supposed tar yields. And then the upper image of marketing communications, uh, given the health warnings that, that you see there uh, in Canada, this would have happened at some point after the year 2000. Uh, but again, you can see a number scheme being used in addition to a, a color coding there with the, the colors of the dots. And then here's a more recent example. I was in South Korea on research leave, uh, a visiting scholar at a university there just in the, this past fall. And this was at the airport in Seoul, Ichon. I think I was on my way to Japan. Uh, but you could see that uh, in the duty-free shops that Virginia Slims was making use of the number scheme of 5-1 and then there were other numbers being used as well. And then I'd like to talk about, as much as Marlboro is known for this historical brand family and the members of the brand family that I was just mentioning, uh, more recently they've gone to a new brand architecture where they've identified three categories of their Marlboro cigarette brand. They refer to their red category, which is really focusing on flavor. Uh, then they have their gold category, which is referring to different diameters of their cigarettes and taste profiles. And then they have a fresh category, which refers to their mentholated brands and increasingly offering more and more brands with capsules and so on. And many of these fresh brands that are mentholated have been offered in black packages. And just to show how much the landscape is changing, according to their annual reports, by 2011, they had 220 different variants now of the Marlboro brand architecture. Uh, but I'd like to just give a case example that even with the black packaging that's used for their capsule and flavor cigarettes, they continue to use different codes to convey supposed hierarchy of tar yields. Uh, so this is an example of Marlboro Ice Blast. It's available in a number of Bloomberg priority countries, uh, but this was acquired in South Korea. And you can see that uh, on the, br the brand on the left has a, a larger blue sh rooftop or chevron that's being used, and it has six milligrams of tar delivery, supposedly, uh, whereas Marlboro Ice Blast 1, where the name speaks to the one milligram of supposed tar delivery, but you can also see the blue chevron is reduced and sh shown to be much smaller to communicate the supposed uh, difference of the brands and offerings. And then here you see in the marketing communications, again, this is at the point of sale in South Korea, but they're very explicitly talking about six milligrams of tar for the larger rooftop and one milligram of tar for the smaller rooftop package that's featured. 
And then when buying both of these variants at the point of sale, what was very telling from the convenience store is that you see the price, it was 4,500 won, which is roughly four US dollars for a pack of cigarettes. But in addition to the price, you can see that they identify the supposed tar delivery. Uh, so it seems to be very important information that they want to communicate from you know, a producer or retail standpoint. And then I mentioned I was making a trip to Japan uh, just this past fall. And so you can see Marlboro Ice Blast was available from a vending machine. And so this is a photograph that I took with my camera of the vending machine on offer. But you can see there the variants are 8 milligrams, 5 milligrams, and 1 milligram supposedly. And then again, correspondingly, you have different sized rooftops to be a code to communicate this hierarchy of tar yields. And then I'm not sure how legible it is for those of you towards the back of the room, but it's uh, priced at 460 yen, which again is roughly equivalent to four US dollars for a pack of cigarettes in Japan. So in summary, uh, with this first case illustration is that uh, there continue to be erroneous health reassurance beliefs that persist among smokers based on the branding designs that are being used on packaging. And so there are two interventions that are commonly uh, thought of uh, as potential ways of uh, counteracting such marketing communication. And one is plain standardized packaging as observed in Australia and increasingly more and more jurisdictions. And then a second approach is as observed in Uruguay, the single presentation requirement, where it stipulates that uh, for a particular brand family, only one member of that brand family can be offered. It's at the discretion of the tobacco companies, such as Philip Morris, which brand member they want to offer. They can choose either Marlboro Red or Marlboro Gold, but they can't offer multiple members because that facilitates and allows for this comparison to be made in terms of a hierarchy of tar yields and infers that there's a less harmful alternative in a misleading way. The second case illustration that I'd like to talk about is an example, very, I indicated Harley-Davidson cigarettes from the 1980s, but this points to a very recent example where brand licensing and brand sharing continues to occur. And so KT&G, uh, the leading tobacco company in South Korea, they've actually now emerged as the fifth largest tobacco company globally. In 2012, they launched a brand of cigarettes known as Lamborghini. And this apparently was a brand that was three years in development, and I think uh, at least one year in terms of making this brand licensing agreement arrangement. Uh, but you can see that the full name of the cigarette brand is Tonino Lamborghini. And this refers to a person, the son, that was the founder of the legendary car brand Lamborghini. And you can see in terms of, again, there's the signature effect there, where he's giving authenticity with the signature on the package. And so this is a brand that's readily available in South Korea, but it's also being marketed uh, or made available duty-free in China, uh, in Russia, and they certainly are trying to launch this brand gl globally. And so you can look at a carton of cigarettes that I acquired in South Korea, duty-free, uh, where with the logo, it very much resembles the iconic um, logo that's seen on you know, Lamborghini automobiles. And speaking to the positioning of the brand, again, this is a way of launching a new brand that uh, you know, has an instant image, identity, uh, strong brand image, but they, they identified that they wanted to have a premium and masculine brand image targeting the assertive, competent, and refined man in possession of the Lamborghini charisma. And they acknowledge in trade press that they are trying to appeal to Korea's younger generation male smokers. And presumably, that applies to other markets where it's being made available as well. Uh, so here is some early advertising when the brand was being launched. And so it was initially introduced with two variants, uh, the yellow and black package. They were offered with supposed tar yields of eight milligrams and six milligrams. And in Korea, that's actually a very high tar delivery. It's a brand market that 
uh, is characterized by mostly men that smoke, but are known to typically uh, seek out very low yield uh, brands. So this was a very co contrasting approach uh, by KTNG, and I think it reflects in part of increasingly a co more competitive landscape uh, in Korea, but also as they go globally and become a global player as the fifth largest tobacco company, I think they wanted a brand in their portfolio that could compete directly with Marlboro, which is the global leader. And so subsequently, they've offered more and more variants, including Ice Volt, which is, uh, they talk about it supposedly uh, delivering a very powerful cooling sensation. So again, this raging bull reasserts sort of how powerful um, this capsulated uh, brand or menthol brand is. And the bull uh, features very prominently in a lot of the marketing communications for the brand and symbolically it represents a powerful, impressive, striking, very daunting beast. Uh, symbolizes also strength, masculinity, regality, uh, and so on. And this is just an image of a point of sale recently in South Korea for the brand. And again, there's been more and more mentholated offerings of this brand. And so again, I think this is strategically for KTNG, very much trying to position one of their brands as a direct competitor to Marlboro. And of course, Marlboro, if you're thinking of an association with an automobile, uh, for, with their longtime sponsorship in Formula One, was very much associated directly with Ferrari. And so it can be seen Ferrari, Lamborghini's counterpart, sort of luxurious, exciting car brands. And so the summary here is just that uh, licensing and brand sharing continues to happen. And brand sharing is explicitly identified in Article 13 guidelines of the WHO FCTC. And Korea, the Republic of Korea, is a party to the WHO FCTC. Uh, also, KTNG is marketing the brand in many uh, markets where they are also parties to the FCTC. But this is clearly a breach of those stipulations. And so uh, it just serves as evidence that important obligations are not being met and uh, hopefully more will be done uh, to counteract uh, what has been developing. Uh, so in summary, uh, I've introduced what we mean by some key terms like branding, brand equity, brand sharing and licensing, um, the notion of brand family. And then I've also provided an overview of common branding strategies and provided two case illustrations, one pertaining to the new evolving brand, Marlboro brand architecture that's developed globally, internationally. And then I've also introduced you to KTNG's Lamborghini brand sharing uh, example. But uh, thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take questions. Maybe I'll just start. Um, Tim, that was great. Thank you so much. I just wanted to ask, since you were involved in the um, Uruguay case and you presented it, um, mentioned it here today, do you have a sense of why no other country has moved forward or has been talking about this single pack, single presentation? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the Uruguay case uh, serves as a a good example of where, um, I mean, you know, credit to Uruguay where they were very innovative in terms of a policy intervention and uh, the court ruling uh, reflected that there was, you know, uh, reasonable evidence and a, a rationale behind having such a requirement. Uh, and I think it really does call for strong consideration by more and more jurisdictions. Uh, Hopefully that case will build momentum for other countries and jurisdictions to consider such a policy intervention. As we've seen with plain and standardized packaging, it took Australia to be very courageous of being the innovator with that policy intervention. And then uh, as there's been more and more court rulings and decisions, uh, it's building more and more momentum where there's more and more confidence for other countries. And we're seeing the effects as well uh, in Australia uh, where yeah, it gives more and more uh, yeah, confidence to other countries to consider 
such a policy intervention. So I hopefully more and more actually consider this. I mean, I think it was a, a very, admittedly a novel policy idea. And so I, I think, you know, still to this day, there are a lot of people that are not even aware of that possibility. But uh, it's certainly a very uh, reasonable one to, to consider. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I guess my question was, you, you talked about the industry perspective, but from the consumer perspective, how much of this is actually resonating with them? Because obviously if you're a chronic smoker, you probably have your one cigarette that you're sticking to and that's, you're, you're not gonna change. So how effective is like the difference in, I guess, uh, tar distribution in terms of the, like, the chronic smokers, the people that are just, they know what they like and they're gonna stick with it? Yeah, so I mean, when there has been the transition, for example, where Marlboro Light is no longer allowable and they've had to make the transition to calling the brand Marlboro Gold, uh, there's often been a lot of marketing communication, both to consumers and as well to retailers uh, to educate them uh, and sort of com further communicate that message to those at point of sale about basically they're acknowledging that Marlboro Light is equivalent to Marlboro Gold. And so they were really trying to educate consumers with their different codes that, you know, when you get Marlboro Gold, it's still the Marlboro Light that you once had. And so uh, they've really tried to facilitate that transition uh, so that it's still communicating very similar things. We've also seen a number of substitute descriptors that might be used. So when you're not allowed to use light, uh, you see, you know, descriptors such as smooth, which is commonly the market research, the consumer research of the tobacco industry speaks to that, uh, communicating reduced irritation to the throat, uh, less of a burning sensation from, from smoking. So there's definitely health inferences to a descriptor like smooth, uh, but we see that persist commonly. Uh, but also you have brand descriptors like subtle, fine, robust. Uh, and again, you know, it can create a sequence of Supposed strength of flavor, but connected with that is supposed tar yield and comparatively, you know, uh, a difference in supposed harm delivered by those products. Um, but to, I mean, as much as I'm, a lot of the work that I've done is looking at the marketing planning documents of the tobacco industry and looking at what they're doing strategically. Uh, but that also reflects that there's a lot of consumer research within their marketing planning documents because obviously their strategy is informed by their consumer research. And so when we talk about what a marketing strategy, we're t commonly talking about identifying a target market, then having a related marketing mix, and they often talk about the four Ps in developing strategy related to product, price, place, or the supply chain distribution as well as promotion. And so it's really important to emphasize the related marketing mix because you really want to have a sophisticated understanding of your consumers and then use that as feedback to develop a related strategy that will really speak to them. So I think my question kind of segues uh, right, right off of that. So when these multinational companies are developing these strategic you know, marketing campaigns or branding strategies, are they really thinking about how to implement particular strategies in certain regions or countries more often than others? Or are they thinking more global strategies, and then the second part is, do you see any ways that we as tobacco control um, uh, researchers can maybe, or not even just researchers, but in general, kind of take this uh, more to the industry rather than being reactive? Yeah. Well, uh, when I talked about identifying a target market, often there's uh, key variables under consideration, including demographics, uh, of course, but also geography. And so, I mean, you give consideration of are you going to have a target market that's based on a particular region of a country? Are you going domestic and national? Or are you going international and more global in scale? And as you introduce your product to new markets and go international, I mean, there's a classic decision that they talk about in terms of to what extent are you going to go with a standardized approach? Or conversely, are you going to go with a more localized, adaptive approach? And it's not either or. It's best thought on a continuum. Um, but there are these decisions that are made where if you look at Philip Morris, 
uh, International with their offering of Marlboro is generally an example of a fairly standardized approach. I mean, they do, I mean, you can't have full standardization in principle because something like price is not going to be identical market to market with different currencies and stru tax structures. But if they're being standardized, they're trying to associate themselves with a premium product. So it would be with a more prestigious pricing, a little bit higher price point relative. And they would be generally quite standardized or consistent market to market with that. And then similarly, their brand image of being rugged, masculine, heroic, independent, I mean, that's quite standardized and consistent market to market. They might be a little bit more localized about how they convey independence and rugged masculinity, but again, they're very consistent with what the brand's associated with. Uh, but then there are other examples where they'll use a very localized approach with a particular market. Uh, I actually recently published a paper in the Journal of Business Ethics in collaboration with uh, Pam Ling uh, from UCSF, uh, Jeff Fong from the University of Waterloo, and Wong Young Beth Lee from Western University. And we were looking at how Virginia Slims has been marketed internationally, and in particular gave emphasis to South Korea and Japan. And Virginia Slims, of course, is a very explicit women's brand in the US and most of the world. But shockingly, it revealed by their marketing planning documents that they're appealing to men in South Korea. And so uh, in this paper, we give a lot of examples of marketing communication and documents that you know, they show both Western men and Korean men smoking the brand and have taglines like for the successful uh, man and uh, it's much more a prestige brand. Uh, so there, in that particular market, they've used a very adaptive approach. Um, so it just depends on the brand strategy and uh, yeah, consideration of, I mean, standardization, there's obviously benefits of economies of scale, of being very consistent. Uh, also, for those that are traveling, uh, if you know what a brand stands for, that can be really reassuring. Of if you go to a Starbucks, you pretty much know what your coffee is going to taste like and the size that it's going to come in and things like that, market to market. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, an adaptive approach can be, you know, being very receptive to local tastes and preferences, and uh, and making yourself less uh, vulnerable to local competitors that might match, you know the particular needs of the market in question. So I'm interested from a regulatory standpoint, when you have like different brands or logos or other types of marketing tactics, um, the meaning of which is like there's a shared understanding, but at the same time, it's kind of shifting over time or cross culturally. What can researchers do, I guess, to kind of generate evidence that I don't know different brands may be misleading or you know, just kind of when when a image a brand doesn't always mean the same thing to everyone all the time. What can we do in a regulatory context? Yeah. Um so I guess there's a few aspects of, of that question. Uh, in terms of uh, cross-cultural meaning, like something like colors, of course, colors can have very different meaning according to the culture in question. So if we look at the color red, I mean, generally, it's considered a very powerful, passionate color, often associated with love and romance, often with market leadership. Uh, you think of Coca-Cola, Marlboro, a lot of the best-selling brands are often with red color packages. But where it can be uh, culturally relevant is that in a country like China, red can be very symbolic of being nationalistic, patriotic. Uh, similarly, in Canada, red would have those kind of connotations. So I mean, there can be more specific meanings to the culture in question. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of misleading, uh, in a legal sense, that's where someone a reasonable consumer is likely to have an impression that is in error. And so that's where it's really been deemed in terms of brand descriptors like light and mild, that that was in fact misleading, that people were adopting supposed light and ultra light brands thinking they were a healthier alternative when in fact they were not. So that's a more obvious case of where uh, it's misleading. Uh, but then the larger picture here is that with a lot of the branding examples that I was giving, 
I mean, I can give examples for a whole array of products. I mean, this is common marketing practice that I'm talking about. But we have to take a step back and think about the product in question here. And I mean, tobacco is an incredibly harmful and addictive product. And so it does lead to questions of where what might be considered appropriate for chewing gum or, or something of, of that nature is not so appropriate uh, considering the nature of the product in question. So there become also issues of where, yeah, how appropriate is it to be associating an extremely harmful and addictive product with being heroic and masculine or feminine or you know, high status and luxury and so on. And uh, so there, there's a real ethical, moral dimension to all of this discussion as well. Just one. that companies are given um, any thought to the marketing and branding design of the packs um, when it comes to counterfeit and um, packs that are in country so like a lot of the examples that you show you know th they're very regional to US or North America um, but they are found in Vietnam and in Pakistan and they they connote various meanings for people here but I guess when you're talking about Feminine, femininity and masculinity, like that can be understood in other areas, but do you, do you know whether or not the branding and the marketing tactics are, of the industry are kind of thinking about like, yes, we know that packs are being sold in other countries illegally and, you know, should our branding also kind of be able to communicate to these markets where they may not understand exactly um, what what this symbolizes or means for North American region, but we want to make sure that they, you know, that they get it in their culture that it holds the same type of meaning um, as well. Yeah, I mean, there has certainly been some high-profile legal cases pertaining to smuggling. Uh, I've not been involved in those, so it, it's stepping out of a domain of my expertise, of in, in particular, uh, you know, to smuggling that might be going on and what the intentions were of particular companies and particular markets. Uh, but I think a, a very recent example is, I know there's been a lot of issues with KT&G as they've emerged with more and more exports and become the fifth largest uh, you know, tobacco company globally, that there are a lot of issues of, according to where their production plants are, and yet where some of their key markets are in terms of uh, tobacco consumption, where there would seem to be uh, issues of where, you know, there's knowingly that there must be as a part of the supply chain smuggling going on. And so I, I know in markets like Pakistan, uh, where, you know, there's an understanding that kt and brands like Pine, I mean, a lot of it, uh, I think, is coming from Afghanistan and so on, of where, you know, it wasn't stamped with you know, being for the Pakistan market, uh, even though that's where it's made available. Um, but I think there, there's actually a, a recent paper about KT&G, uh, Kelly Lee from Simon Fraser University uh, was a lead author, I think, of that paper, where they talk a little bit about some of the dynamics of KT&G and about how their brands are being smuggled. So that'd be one good resource uh, to finding out a little bit more about that. I mean, certainly uh, tobacco companies don't want there to be uh, opportunities for counterfeit brands, though. Of, uh, they they want to be uh, succeeding. You know, they would protect their brand in terms of trademark infringement. Of, you know, if, if a brand was trying to pass itself as Marlboro when, in fact, it wasn't produced by Philip Morris International. I think we're out of time. Dr. Dewhurst can, take, can stay a few minutes after if you have any other questions. But I just want to thank you for sharing all the interesting and really important work that you're doing. So thanks so much. My pleasure. Thanks for the invite.